Good morning, everyone. Um, hi, I'm Anna Walker, um, otherwise known as Felt It, and I'm coming here to you today to give you a little basics about what is felting and what can I create with felting and why is it so much fun that she's been doing this for 12 years. So um, I have been felting since I won an online giveaway of a hand-painted roving. Um, now a roving is um, fleece wool that has been washed and then combed and then dyed. And this isn't dissimilar to the color that I won, but I won it and, and it was so soft. I could smell a little bit of the sheep and the, the soap and water that had gone into a little bit of the, the process, but I, what was I gonna do with this? And so I found a $4 Teach Yourself to Needle Felt kit at the local craft store and I taught myself how to needle felt and then I learned how to wet felt and then I learned about shibori felting and nuno felting and all things felting and I've been hooked ever since. So what I'd like to do today is tell you a little bit about felting, what it is, a little bit of the history of it, and then show you some of the things that that you can make. Um, when it comes to felt, you can do anything from very simple cookie cutter shapes that you can decorate to incredible sculptures like my friend Jennifer Shermerhorn does. Um, and it, it, wonderful two-dimensional paintings like Danny Ives does um, and amazing wool felt paintings that um, Moy McKay does and I had the extreme pleasure to be able to work with Moy in February when I went to Scotland. So let's talk a little bit about felting and hopefully I'll be able to um, take away the question marks that you've got when you hear someone say, oh yeah, I love to felt. Um, you know, it's more than just the craft felt that you see at the, at the hobby store. So I'm going to turn the camera down. And we're going to talk a little bit about the fibers, about the process, and go from there. So here we go. All right, so in front of you, you have my stab bucket. And in this bucket, I have a lot of different styles and types of wool. And I just want to pull a few of them out and show you what things you can do with the different wools. Basically what you're doing when it comes to felting, I'm going to move the bucket off. When it comes to felting, you're going to start with fiber, generally fiber that's been washed and processed into a long strand and this is called a roving. Um, all roving means is that it has been carded or combed so that all the fibers are going the same direction. This makes it a whole lot easier for you to pull off bits and pieces to work with the fibers and to build up your um, project slowly. Now there are two types of felting. Both types you can use um, animal fibers for. That means wool, alpaca, llama, yak, camel. You can even felt with um, dog and cat fur um, because it's an animal fiber. Um, but only um, needle felting can you use non-plant fibers like bamboo or milk fiber or um, hemp fiber or um, man-made fibers uh, like nylon, um, anything that's made from plastic. You can needle felt with any kind of fiber. Um, but wet felting, you need to use animal fibers. And you need to use animal fibers that have not been processed to keep them from shrinking. It's called superwash. Superwash is a chemical process that closes the barbs on the fiber, on the length of the fiber. If you were able to look at this fiber under a microscope, you would see that there are scales, kind of like you would imagine dragon scales or snake scales. And during the wet felting process, you 
change the pH of those fibers so that you open up those scales so that when you're massaging and rolling, those scales become closer and closer interlocked until they form felt. This mask was made in a wet felting process. I'm using needle felting to add the embellishment, but all of this undyed fiber here was made during a wet felting process. It was just simply three layers of wool on two sides of a template, add hot soapy water, and a little bit of squishing, a little bit of massaging, and a little bit of rolling. And a couple of hours later, we had a piece that I could sculpt into the shape that I wanted. And then I was able to let it dry. And because wool has a memory, it's holding the shape. I don't have to worry about this ever going out of shape. It's going to hold this unless I wet felt it, get it wet and soapy again, and change the shape of it which I won't do because I, I like the shape of this mask, but this is a wet felted process. This is a needle felted process. And I just took my barbed needle, and if you look at the needles very, very closely, and I'm gonna see if I can get this close enough and turn it just a little bit. Can you see those little glints along the side? Let's see if I can get it a little closer. Oh, that's a good angle. Let's see if we can see the barbs. If you see those little notches along the shaft down on this end, those notches do the same thing that that massaging did when we changed the pH. And each time you go through the fiber, it pulls those fibers closer and closer together until they lock in place. That's how I made this little uh, feather um, that I wanted to try a process out and I like the way it turned out. And so I'm going to keep working on this to get it to be exactly the way I want it to be. So this is a needle felting process. This is a wet felting process. But felting just means that you're taking the fibers and you're causing them to interlock either through a mechanical means with the barbed needles or through a wet felting means by way of changing the pH and then massaging and agitating the fibers a little bit to get those fibers to come together. Have you ever had a sweater or a scarf or a pair of socks go through the wash that shouldn't be going through the wash and they turned up to be about this much smaller? That's felting. That is a very good way to think of felting. You're taking the fibers or causing them to shrink and interlock together until they form a new piece. So, this is an undyed roving. This is a bat, and a bat takes that undyed roving and it opens up those fibers so that they're a lot more fluffy and so that you can pull them out a little lighter and a little easier to get almost little clouds of fiber that you can add a little bit at a time to create your design. This is something called pre-felt. I'm gonna hold it up to the camera and the light. You see how the light shines through a little bit? Well, this is only partially needle felted fiber. Now this is wet feltable fiber, but it's been partially processed with needles to make it um, possible for you to have basically um, a fabric, as it were, that you can cut shapes out of and add to a project, whether it's needle felting or wet felting. And you can see that this one has been used because it's got cut out pieces on it. And pre-felts come in all sorts of different colors and different fibers, although for the majority of the pre-felts that I've seen, um, most of them are uh, good quality fiber like uh, Merino. Let's see, what else have we got here? Okay, these are fiber bits that are left over from the carding process that haven't been carded, but are too small to really go through the carding machine. And so they look closer to the natural locks of the fibers and these make it possible, one, for you to get colored fiber at a really good price, but two, you're able to take little bits of this and you can do some finger blending sometimes 
to get yourself a perfect color. So if you've got a nice um, variety of colors in basic colors, you can take a little bit of one color and you can add it to another color and change that color just a little bit just by adding those colors together and this is just a simple little finger blend here and you can blend it as much or as little as you want to get the color and the striation factor that you want but this is just another way that you can get fiber and you can see that the more I blend the more um, even the color becomes and the more you get a new color here and we could keep blending until we see no little individual bits and you can see that it's not really orange and it's not really yellow but it's now a nice blend of the two I want to see if I have any locks in here because locks are really interesting to look at too let's see no no locks let me get some locks here because I know I've got some right over here Locks are another way that you can get fiber and it's another way to take a look at how the fiber can come to you. These are locks that had been dyed. Now you can get locks both dyed and undyed, but these have been dyed and you can see these have come just straight off the sheep, okay? They've been washed very gently um, and they've been dyed without having been combed into a roving and what makes these so neat to use these are still even a little bit in the grease which means that the um, wool wasn't scoured before these locks were um, dyed so you can feel a little bit of the lanolin in your hand but if you look at that you can see that using the locks you can have that lovely crimp from the natural fiber, the way it comes off the sheep, and you can add some texture and variety to your project by using locks. So, all of these things in place, how does this felting thing work? Well, I'll go over needle felting today, I'll give you a little bit of a basics. And I'm just gonna take and let you know the tools that you're gonna to need to use for needle felting. Needle felting is, is very easy to get tools. You can buy either foam bases or you can buy um, brush bases. <coughs> Excuse me. You need a base to protect your table and to make it possible for you to have something to set your project on top of while you're working. Now I've worked, I you can tell, I have brushes and I have the foam base. Foam base is my preferred and the foam that I like to use is called closed cell foam. This foam has a sturdy factor. This one in particular that I purchase and I um, cut into um, blocks to sell on my site is um, a non-static foam. So it doesn't um, grab hold of the fiber quite as much as other types of foam do. It will show the wear and tear, but unlike other foams, when you're using it, it'll get a little squishier, but it's not going to get as much of a sunken hole kind of look as you would get with some other foams. Now, that being said, you can use a car wash sponge, you can use an old cushion from a chair that you had, you know, taken apart and reupholstered. You can use anything you want. You just want to have a base to protect either your lap, if you're, you know, felting on your lap, or to protect your table. It also protects your needles because while these needles are indeed very sharp, and I will tell you the story, there's the hole right there on the tip of my finger. I impaled myself. Let's see, do I have it around here somewhere? I impaled myself. This is the worst injury I've had in 12 years. I wasn't watching what I was doing and this part of the needle went straight through my finger the other day. Hurt like a son of a gun, had to have my son push it through and pull it out, but you know what? It's fine just now. But this part of the needle from here to the end is the most dangerous part. It is sharp, it can and will draw blood, and it will go through your finger. 
um, but it's also the most fragile. So if you don't have a base and you're trying to felt just on the tabletop, you could bend or break off the tip here needle and that would render it useless, okay? So the base is important. It's an important part of your felting tools. For needles, I recommend their needles come in sizes from 36 up to 42 and the higher the number the finer the needle my go-to's for almost everything are a size 38 or a size 40. i like the star shape star shape is really a diamond shape it has four sides most uh, felting needles are a triangle shape and so they've got three sides and on each of those edges are those barbs the four-sided needle will help you felt a little bit faster. So if you have an opportunity to get a variety of needles, I would recommend size 38 star and a size 40 star. Needles also come in a star shape and in the triangle shape. You can also get a spiral shape. You can get a close barb. You can get a reverse felting needle where instead of as you're going into the fiber, it grabs the fibers. As you pull out of the fiber, it grabs the fibers. So what you're doing then is you are able to, if you've got a different color underneath, you're able to pull that through to the top. An instance would be if you had, let's say this is a, a face of a creature and you want to have little wisps of whiskers coming out, you would use a reverse needle to pull out a little bit of the undyed wool to make it look like it had the wispy um, whiskers on there. But that gives you an idea. This, I used a cookie cutter shape to create my little name tag here, and then I just simply needle felted a rainbow of locks all around the bottom and added a little um, magnetic badge holder to the end so that I've got a wonderful little name tag when I need to go out and about. So, needle felting. How do you do it? What are you gonna do with it? Well, let's start with a simple shape. And I'm gonna take just a little bit of the wool. Now what I'm doing first is pulling it apart and overlapping it. What I'm trying to do is find out what the staple length is or in other terms, how long the fibers are that when they were cut off from the sheep, okay? Shearing does not hurt the sheep at all. In fact, it keeps them healthy because it keeps the weight down, it makes it possible for them to get around a whole lot easier without that extra weight of the wool on there. So what I'm gonna do first, I've just overlapped. This is how long the fiber length, the staple length is. And I know that because if I try and pull it apart and my fingers are too close, it's not gonna pull apart. If I pull my fingers out to the very edge, then it pulls apart. So I know that this is how long the staple length is. And we're just gonna make a simple sphere. And that'll be what we'll do for today to give you a basics of felting. I'm just tying a very gentle overhand knot in the center of that, see? And then I'll come in and I will wrap the fibers around and we will make a sphere. Now, Anna's three rules of needle felting are this. Always know where your non-stabbing hand is. Obviously, since I stabbed myself in the uh, finger the other day, I wasn't paying attention to that. You can come at the um, project from different angles. Just make sure that when you go into the fiber, you come out the same direction. Because again, if you're going into the fiber and you try and turn it and come out a different way, remember the end of the needle is the most deadly, but it is also the most fragile. So if you come in at one angle and you change your mind and come out at another angle, you're going to risk, again, bending or breaking off the tip of that needle. So those are two of the rules. Okay, watch where your non-stabbing hand is and come out of the fiber the same direction you go into the fiber. The third rule, and you can't see this very well because of where my arm is. I'll move this over a little bit like this. I am taking and I am not really bending my wrist. You don't want to bend your wrist. You want to bounce from your elbow. 
your elbow is designed to do this. Your wrist, while it can do that, will get you set up with some repetitive stress injury if you continue to do that. So what I like to recommend is that wherever you are, if you can rest your elbow on the table, rest your elbow on the table and use it to bounce your needle. You're just doing a light pouncing up and down. If you use your wrist, only use it very, very briefly. But I want you to predominantly think of your wrist as being in a, um, in a splint or in a cast. I want you to think that your wrist can't move at all and that you're using your elbow only to move your hand up and down to pounce your needle through. I just was thinking of something and it just flew right out of my mind. It was something about felting process. I'll think of what it is. Now, it's not necessary to stab so deeply. You notice that I'm not hitting the pink foam at all. I am keeping to just inside the fiber. It's not necessary to really punch hard. This is a pouncing motion. Just a very gentle up and down pouncing motion. Now, I realize that you looking at this, you're going, man, her fingers are really close to that needle. And yes, they are, but again, I learned my lesson the other day and I'm watching very closely what my non-stabbing hand is doing compared to my stabbing hand. If you are nervous about uh, when you're first starting about working with the needle and getting too close, you can use another needle to help you hold that in place and then you can move your stabbing hand around. Now, I'm coming at it from different angles, but I am also coming out of the fiber the same direction I'm going into the fiber and I am moving my hand around instead of moving the ball around so much. And I'm making sure that when I change angles, and I can come at a project from different angles, I just want to make sure that I come out of the fiber the same direction I go into the fiber. Now, we've got our basic ball shape. Is it done? Not to my likings because there's still a lot of squish in here. How do you know when it's done? Well, that's, that's the last part of our lesson for today, and I'm going to show you how. I'm going to hold your hand like this. Coincidentally, this is the same way you can tell how well done a steak is. If you press right here, make a fist, tuck your thumb in, press right here between this knuckle and this knuckle. Very, very soft, very, very squishy. That's rare felt. That's um, how well done you would want that felt to be if you're going to have it behind glass, not be touched, not be manipulated at all. There are very few cases in which I would recommend a rare felt. Feel right here along the, between the first knuckle and second knuckle of your index finger. That is a medium felt or a medium done stick. This one is sort of between medium and rare, okay? But you can tell the difference between the squish factor when you go back and forth between these two, okay? So this is rare, this is medium. Most items that are gonna be handled, if you are doing a name tag, if you are doing um, a mask that's gonna be on your face and taken on and put off, if you're making a hat, if you are creating an accessory, uh, earrings, bracelet, necklace, you want to have well done felt or a well done steak and that's what it's going to feel like right here. There's another way to tell if it's done too, but this is my go-to. Rare, medium, and well done felt. The other test is called the pinch test and what you do is you take your item, if it were a flat item, you'd go top and bottom and you have a very thin edge going right here and the idea is if you can pinch and pull the fibers away from the base, then you've got some more felting to do. And you see for our sphere here, we've got some more felting to do. But that is the basics for today. I just wanted to give you a little um, basic felting tutorial um, so that you could see 
the where we start where we start with that felting and I'll be coming to you on uh, Monday Wednesdays and Fridays 10 a.m. just to give you some insight into felting and how it works and if you want more information head on over to my website stabthingsintoexistence.com I've got kits available there there are um, blog articles to read that will give you some more information about felting and how I work this. And I'll look forward to seeing you on Friday. Hope you all have a great day. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye.